Hi and welcome to this very special interview with Hala Gorani, award-winning journalist and news anchor. She recently published her book, You Don't But You Don't Look Arab, uh, on identity and belonging. Uh, Hala, thank you for this interview and thank congratulations uh, on this book. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, you have a line uh, in the book saying, I allowed questions about my identity to hurt me. That was uh, in, a, in a description uh, with uh, some uh, of your friends uh, over dinner in, in Paris. And fast forward to today, and you have this, this book, but you don't look Arab, um, to discuss identity and to discuss that struggle. Um, I wanted to ask you, what made you think of writing this book? I think I, uh, because I've heard that question so many times in my life, but you don't look Arab, because people's idea of what Arabs look like, how they act, how they think, in their minds, there's, there's this stereotype attached to that label. And I wanted to dispel it. I wanted to explain to viewers who may not be from the Middle East, but also readers from the Middle East, that this is a very diverse population with a variety of views and tastes and cultures. That was part of it. The other part was what you just said, uh, that I allowed for too long, I think, in my life growing up, questions about my identity to be hurtful to me. I wanted more than anything when I was a child to be like everyone else. I grew up in Paris, in France, um, the daughter of Syrian immigrants. I felt like a foreigner. And it, it was hurtful, especially because being an Arab from a Muslim background uh, was something that was often associated with very negative attributes in a society that still is deeply I think distrustful at best and perhaps discriminating uh, at worst against uh, er the, the Arab minorities. I know that you've taken some time off in the last uh, two years. And my question is, do you think that you would have had the time, the space, and probably most importantly, the peace of mind yeah. to write this book? I mean, it's a good question. I, I, think, uh, I think I needed the time off regardless of the book because after 25 years, of mainly anchoring, especially the last 10 years and not being in the field. I really missed uh, being in the thick of things, uh, practicing the kind of journalism that involves going to where the, the, the story is rather than covering it from a TV studio. And to be clear, there's nothing wrong with covering news in a TV studio. In fact, it can be a very enlightening exercise. If you have the right guests, you have a lot of control over your hour. I could book my own guests and decide what the lead story was, which I don't have uh, uh, that kind of control anymore at all. But I was really missing what made me love journalism in the first place. And so I took the opportunity to move away, to step away from a show uh, that was fabulous and gave me a lot, and also then use another muscle. It's almost like you're always exercising the same muscle in the gym, right? You just have to do, it's, it's leg day every day. <laughs> do an arm or an upper body day every once in a while, it won't hurt. <laughs> um, so the, the language that you use for writing a book is completely different from writing for yeah. broadcast. Did you find it easy to move from the style of write, news writing into writing a book? Well, I had to get acquainted with this incredible thing called punctuation all over again, which, as you know, in television is not our friend. I always tell young writers, you know, if you have a comma in your sentence, that means it's too long because a sentence in TV is one idea and then you move on to the next one. But I read a lot before I started writing. So I, my brain was immersed, was bathing in beautiful writing from fabulous authors before and so it gave me before I started launching into it even though I had sold the book and I and the ideas were laid out I hadn't really started drafting it until many months later so the writing part actually was not the hardest part at all the hardest part was the editing after so I didn't find it as difficult as I thought I would maybe also because I started out in print as a young journalist I want to move to the part for it to talk about your uh, struggle in identity. Mm -hmm. um, you wrote that you carry within you a confusing cocktail of ethnic uh, and national identities. Mm -hmm. um, has your identity as a female uh, Arab journalist uh, worked to your advantage at times, uh, being a female journalist working from the Middle East? Yeah, um, certainly in the field it works to your advantage. 
I think also when you're somebody who uh, comes from kind of a different ethnic background, perhaps it gives you a little bit more of a connection with the people you're covering. Certainly, I believe it gave me more empathy for the suffering of people in certain parts of the world who come from cultures that I know, uh, specifically in the Middle East, but also when I was in Haiti uh, covering the earthquake there. This is a story that stayed with me for a long time. The fact that I spoke French, I think that I was able to kind of speak the same language as the people rather than relying on an interpreter makes a big difference. That was an advantage. The problem is it's very difficult for me to assess any disadvantage because I, nobody's ever going to come up to you and say openly, I didn't give you the job because frankly, <laughs> your, your name and your background uh, wouldn't play well on our air. I suspect it wasn't always to my advantage, to be honest. I didn't tick every box, I think, that was expected of on-air correspondence in Western media when I started out. You have to remember this was you know, 25 years ago when there were very few women with my, um, with, with similar profiles. You have so many more now. Um, so you, so the title of your book, but you don't look Arab, mm -hmm. those comments that you've heard being, um, you know, you grew up in the West. Uh, but I wanted to know what, what it was like on the other side. Mm -hmm. Did you hear comments that you don't look Arab in the Middle East, or you don't All the time. You don't behave like an Arab. All the time. When I was little, uh, and I was uh, visiting Syria, my parents' uh, family in Syria, my uh, aunts and uncles, to tease me, would say, Halal Amerikaniye. <laughs> and I hated it. It just drove me crazy, because I thought to myself, well, I'm a foreigner in America, Ajnabiya bi America, Ajnabiya bi Suriya. I don't belong anywhere, right? So I felt like, you know, that's part of why the book was so important for me to write, because I felt like even within my own family, I was Ajnabiya, you know? So yeah, I did hear it from everywhere. I heard it in France, I hear it in the UK. You have an American accent. If I'm in the US, you have an Europeanized accent. Do you think that the book helped you uh, heal some aspects of that struggle in your identity? Do you feel like you moved on from that? Or do you still feel that that identity, uh, I, I call it struggle, but did you yeah. feel that it still lingers? No, it was definitely a struggle. I think, uh, no, I think the healing came before. I didn't really feel like this book was the exercise that I needed. By the time I got to the book, I had already, I think, worked through some of the issues and realized that uh, who I am is actually just fine. And in fact, if anything, it, it's quite an asset. But it took me a while. But I wanted to write this book not just for me. I wanted to write it for people, for younger people who may be facing the same questions, not just Arabs, people from other minorities, women, because the issue with uh, working in this industry as, as a woman is that you still face a, quite a lot of ageism uh, and much more so than men and in some cases you know sexism in terms of what the expectations are of women in this industry it's changed a lot I want to be clear but it, 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 it still needs it has still has some ways uh, to go especially uh, in management ranks I think we need more women leading in uh, networks uh, rather than just being right underneath or in middle management which we which, which which is an area very populated by women but not the top top jobs how did it feel being from such a troubled region mm -hmm. well it, it feels um so here's the thing it's it's it, it there are two aspects to this the reason i wanted to write the book was also to ex not explain, but also to send a message again that being from the Middle East doesn't mean that your life is constantly consumed by chaos and war and checkpoints. And, you know, this region has some of the most beautiful artists and poets, poets and novelists and scientists and the rest of it. And it's, uh, it's an effort to humanize a part of the world that is often seen only through the lens the Western lens of, of, uh, of media coverage of its crises, right? So it's like covering the region only when there's a war or understanding the region only 
through its conflicts. It's like knowing someone or talking to someone only when they're having a nervous breakdown. You're not going to know them, right? You're not going to know every facet of their identity. And I wanted this to be more of an exploration of every facet of the identity of someone from the Middle East. The other side of your question is how does it feel to come from a part of the world that is going through a really tough time? And in the grand arc of history, obviously, it's not just the last 10 years, it's really the last several decades, is, is really, of course it hurts me. It hurts me. Syria is, is a terrible, um, it, it's, it's, it, 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 it has really affected me and still has affected me because even though I wasn't born there and, or never lived there, it was like a family member and that family member is suffering and it hurts to see it and it hurts to see what's happening in other parts of the region. And um, I don't know in our lifetime if we'll ever see that part of the world come back together, I don't know. I wanna move and talk about your work, mm -hmm. um, your work as a female uh, journalist and a news anchor. Um, so you, were, you, were, you grew up in the West and you were educated in Paris. Yeah. Do you think that you would have had the same success if you were if you grew up in the Middle East or were educated in, in Middle Eastern um, universities? I mean, I guess it depends where, because the Middle East is so vast. So you have, and the center of gravity has very much moved to Gulf countries, you know, the UAE and, and, and uh, you see it. You see the universities there, you see the educated young people moving there because there are job opportunities. The flip side of that is the Levant is losing its best and brightest. Uh, it is certainly going through, in the case of Lebanon, for instance, banking collapses, port explosions, corruption, conflict, Syria with its 13-year now uh, state of complete crisis and conflict. So um, I think it depends a little bit. Um, it's hard to answer a hypothetical like that, but there is opportunity in the Middle East, and I, and I think it's a region that's still that's try, that's rearranging itself in a way geographically. But as I said, I think the center of gravity is moving to another part of the region while the Levant is losing its footing in some ways. Yeah. Um, looking back um, at your, you know, you've been in journalism for 25 years. Yeah. Are you happy with how international media reported on the Middle East? I think there was, when I really, my first big foreign assignment was the Iraq War, uh, starting in 2003. And I think to, if it, there was a lack of humanization of Arabs in that conflict from media organizations. And I think the reason for that was the lack of representation of diverse journalists. And that has changed, and I see a big change in the last 20 years uh, of, of how that region is covered. So I, I found it frustrating when I was in my you know, early 30s covering Iraq that oftentimes the Iraqi civilian was only covered uh, insofar as he or she affected American or Western strategic interests. And that was a shame. And so whenever I went there, I made a point of covering civilian uh, stories rather than hopping on an embed, what we call an embed, which is accompanying the military on missions, etc. But as I said again, and there is progress to be made, I think that still, I think that it, things are much better now. The other thing I would add, and this is very important, is there's Arabia, there's Jazeera, there's all these networks that didn't exist really or were very new when the Iraq war started and that are now mature news organizations covering their own region. So fundamentally, the media picture has changed completely. And when I consume news, I watch news in the English language. And even though my Arabic is weak, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to ask you to say it. Uh, sure, I will say it. Uh, I will speak in Arabic as well as I can. Please don't laugh. But as, as much as I can understand it, or if there's an English version, version like Al Jazeera English, Arabia English, whatever, I will go and consume news from the reporters from that region because that's going to be the best way for me to understand a story fully from that angle and from that angle. Um, you say in your book, um, 
A big part of the challenge of being a woman in news is that we're often judged for not showing toughness. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you how, how it was being uh, an Arab woman uh, working for international media. It's, um, it's kind of, here's the thing I would say about that is we're judged for not showing toughness, but then when we show toughness, we don't necessarily get rewarded for it funnily. Um, and it's something that men never have to think about, right? They don't have to kind of start uh, assessing in their minds whether or not their reaction is going to work against them or not. They just are, you know, because they have never really had to be judged by how tough or weak or emotional they are. Or sidelined. Or sidelined for being, standing up for themselves. That can happen too. Um, so it was a learning curve. Um, I think standing up for oneself also sometimes leads to big career changes like mine where you think actually I want to do something else and I think I'm just going to do it even though that's not the expectation that people have for me. To what extent do you think age and looks are important to um, female journalists? Unfortunately, as I said, some um, decision makers would sideline a uh, woman because of that. What, what do you say? What do you say to that? And what do you tell uh, Arab journalists aspiring to have a career in, in media? Well, I would look at the media landscape and 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 count on probably the fingers of maybe two hands how many women are over the age of say 60 and still in prominent anchoring positions on television. There are very few of them. For that reason, I would say it, there still is ageism and it affects women disproportionately. There's an expectation of how women still need to look on TV that isn't an expectation that is, uh, you know, that affects men. And uh, I write in the book about a, an Australian TV host who wore the same suit every day for a year. <laughs> and his female co-star, of course, was not going to get away with wearing the same outfit every year and constantly scrutinized for what she was wearing. And I would say you have a female tax as well that men don't pay, even though men in many professions, and most I would say, probably almost all of them are paid more than women for the same work. We have to have our, we have to get our hair done. We have to get makeup. We have to wear something nice and different and varied. And we get no reimbursement for that overall. We don't get more money for it, but we have to pay the money out. So there's still uh, a lot of progress to be, to be made. And uh, for, you know, me, for me and for, for every woman in this industry, especially when you're in front of the camera, it's something you, you realize early on. I have two more questions. Sure. Um, uh, you're starting a new chapter in your career. Um, is there any personality or political figure from the Middle East that you'd like to, uh, you would like to sit down with and interview? Um, is in politicians or just any political any, any figure? Any well, I just interviewed Yusra for Vogue Arabia, <laughs> so she was fabulous. <laughs> I had a great conversation with her, actually, because I got to know her a lot better because I knew her as this kind of iconic Egyptian actress. And then I went back and watched all her movies, including the Yakubian building, where she played a fabulous character named Christine, who owns great that movie. bar. Yes. So um, I'm lucky in that sense that I also write for Vogue Arabia and I get to meet a bunch of interesting and fabulous and entertaining people. I would say that the most quoted author in my book is Amin Malouf. So if I could sit with anybody, uh, maybe I should request, uh, I'll request an interview now with him. He was just elected to head the Académie Française in France. Um, and um, he is, you know, to me, one of the most inspirational, uh, astute, philosophically just uh, st stirring, uh, writers on the question of identity. And if you really want to understand identity, tribalism, uh, the folly of, of Middle Eastern conflict, you read Amin Malouf and you will understand his novels and his nonfiction books and you'll understand it. So I would say probably him in a one-on-one, -on -one I, would, I would be very, very happy to interview him. You have a very big fan, a ba fan base in, in the Middle East. Would you like to say something in Arabic for our audience? Um, <laughs> Tayyib.
بس ما تضحكي علي عربيتك منيحة طيب. <تصفيق> <تصفيق> لأنه أنا بحكي عربي آه مع لهجة حلبية عم تسمعي لهجة الحلبية تبعتي <تصفيق> أحلى لهجة <تصفيق> أحلى لهجة <تصفيق> أوكي <تصفيق> أنا بحبها <تصفيق> طيب بقول شكرا كتير آه مشان هالانترفيو و شو كمان وإن شاء الله بنشوف بعد آه كمان آه ونحكي عن الـ مو عن الـ المشاكل الـ الـ السياسة بس انه نروح نشرب قهوة مثلا مع بعض ونحكي عن يسرى والفن من الشرق الاوسط او هيك شيء مع بعض That was perfect Thank you Hala Uh, thank you. This was an interview with a very special Hala Gorani to discuss her new book, But You Don't Look Arab. Thank you for watching.